he mysteriously disappeared. 80 million, completely gone, and he was never found. Akai was once one of the largest hi-fi companies in the entire world. Their Tokyo factories employing over 100,000 workers, surpassing 40 billion in sales. Then overnight, Akai was gone. Here is what happened. Akai was founded by Machikichi Akai in July of 1929 as a manufacturer of radio components and electrical parts. Masakichi's business expanded rapidly through the 20s and 30s. His eldest son, Saburo, grew up in the factory and later enrolled himself in night school at the Tokyo Institute of Technology to study electrical machinery. As Akai grew, they expanded in the production of electrical motors, due largely to Saburo's new expertise in electrical engineering. The new business generated by the production of electrical motors allowed the father-son team to move their facilities from their backyard premises to a larger factory in Kamada in 1933. Everything was going great for Akai until the onset of World War II, where only 10 days after getting married in 1939, Saburo would get drafted. During the war, Masukichi needed to sell off all his equipment and even the premises. This looked to be the end of Akai before the hi-fi company even got started. Everything was bought by a company called Sawafuji Electric. After the war ended, Saburo came home to find the company sold, but his father secured him a job as part of the sale with Sawafuji Electric as an engineer, thanks to his schooling. Business was still booming, and so good that by 1947, Saburo raised his capital investment in the new firm, bought back the Kamada plant from Sawafuji, and changed the name of the company to the Akai Electrical Company. By 1948, Akai started selling phonograph motors. At this time, technology was changing rapidly and there was a demand for higher precision record players. And Akai would accept that challenge. By upgrading the technology of their phono motors, Akai was one of the few medium-sized companies to export goods without going through a wholesaler. Saburo had advertised in the American technical journal Electronics. The headline, Why Not Buy Akai Technology, generated several inquiries from various companies, including Roberts Electronics. Roberts presented Saburo with an overwhelming demand for literally anything Akai was producing, and both Roberts and Akai's business started to rapidly grow. Saburo was curious as to what Roberts was doing with their products. In response, Roberts sent Akai a tape recorder. Technicians at Akai would quickly look this recorder over and build their own in response. They sent the new Akai built tape recorder to Roberts, and in response to that, Roberts was quick to ask them to start manufacturing for them, and in return, Roberts would handle worldwide sales. In 1954, Akai built their first tape recorder, the AT-1. The AT-1 came as a kit for the consumer to build. A very simple design, the AT-1 was a tube reel to reel whose chassis was built with heavy duty steel, and it had a fairly simple belt and motor design. Design. The AT-1 would be followed by the Model 900, which was even more well-received. Orders started flying in, and because of the immense sales, Saburo decided to journey to the U.S. to further study the market. He quickly realized that he would need to up the quality of his product to sell in that American market. In 1957, Akai introduced the deluxe mono version of the 900 and a stereo version the following year. At this point, Akai started to have a firm grasp on the market. And 1958 would also be the year that Saburo finally took over the role as president of Akai from his father. During the late 1950s and early 1960s, most music listening consisted of listening to live performances, the radio, and the record player. But Akai was promoting the pleasures of listening to tape recordings. And the fact that unlike other other music sources, the listener could record anything they wanted. 1960 brought the release of the first Akai and Roberts co-branded tape recorder, the Duet 191 FT. This was a mono recorder with an external amplifier and speakers. Akai tape recorders would continue to be branded Roberts in the U.S. market, and despite the wide range of other recorder manufacturers, Akai's sales were exceptionally high. Throughout the 1960s, Akai would continue to make a reputation as a producer of premier audio tape recorders. Now, 1962 brought the debut of the the Akai M7, which I have seen branded under both the Akai and the Roberts names, followed by its successor, the M8, in 1964. Akai equipped them with the new Xfield magnetic recording system. The Xfield system was from when Akai adopted Tanberg's Crossfield recording technologies, the use of an extra tape head to enhance high frequency recording. These two models sold over 160,000 units in just four years, and it firmly established Akai as the leader in the tape field. 
In 1970, Akai set up Akai America in the States. Akai wanted to brand their products under the name Akai going forward instead of Roberts, as their franchise for North America was set to expire in 1971. Akai would continue a relationship with Roberts going forward for certain products. Akai then would debut their first full line of tape players at CES later that year. This lineup included models already in production as well as several new models as well. Here's a look at many of the Akai reel-to-reels made during the 1970s. Let me know in the comments which ones that you have owned or wanted to own. Akai had several reel-to-reels during the 1970s, including the 4000 series. They also had the X series featuring standard permaloy heads. This series included the 1800 series, the 2000 series, and the X5000. As an improvement over the X series, Akai released the GX series featuring the newer glass heads. This series includes the GX200 series, the GX300 series, and the GX620, 630, and 650D. Most of the reel-to-reels were two tracks, but if you see an SS after the model's name, that means they were four-track reels, like the GX280D SS, the 130D SS, and the GX400 DSS. Akai also made a few DB models, which included Dolby noise reduction built in, such as the 4000 DB, the GX600 DB, and the GX630 DB. Now, several of these models featured built-in speakers, eight tracks, and even cassette decks. The letter D after the model signified it's just a deck without an amplifier or speakers. The finishes for these reels were available in wood and leather on some models. Now, this was signified by the W or the L at the end of the model number so that you could pick which one you wanted. As you can see, Akai during the 1970s paved the way for tape recorders. They led the market and they would continue to do so into the early 1980s. Akai. Akai still came out with several new models in the 1980s, and Akai's tape decks from the 1980s tended to hold up better over time. They featured shiny faceplates and were just some of the best looking decks ever. Akai even made pro tape recorders like the highly regarded Pro 1000 and incorporated some modern or futuristic designs like the popular GX77. An attempt to bolster flagging sales by the now declining reel to reel marketplace, Akai came up with this striking, small, and easy to use machine that would, with its 7 inch reel capacity, fit into almost any hi fi console, much like a cassette deck. The GX77 was available from 1982 to 1984 in silver or black and retailed for about $800. But the most famous Akai reel to reel tape decks ever made, and the final in production for Akai, were the 600 series and the renowned 747. The 600 series consists of the GX625, the GX635, the GX636, and the GX646. You can typically find this series at a less expensive price tag than the 747, with only a few less features. But my favorite part of this series is the RC70 remote. I know you thought I was gonna say it was some recording feature, but no, the remote was more fun. Now, in a previous video at our old location, we took this remote to the streets to see how far of a distance that it would work from. All right, Cole, head back. Keep going. Oh, this is so cool. At Monica's desk. Oh, behind the desk. Go in the bathroom. Coming in at a whopping 46 pounds, this Akai GX635D takes no prisoners. With its 62 dB signal to noise ratio, a 0.04% wow and flutter, and a total harmonic distortion at only 0.5%, the only thing that could make this better would be a remote control. But Ruta Reels don't have remotes. Well, this one does.
from downtown. Ha ha ha! This remote is brand new. So we're gonna see how far this remote works from. All right, Cole, head back behind the desk. Go in the bathroom. <laughs> it works from the bathroom. Dude, we should take it out on the street. Ah! Works from the middle of the street. Now the last tape recorder manufactured by Akai, the Akai GX747 is mainly an updated version of the previous Akai 646 and its previous versions. But it's probably the most well remembered tape recorder of all time. Now the standard version was available in silver and black with LED meters, but the DBX version was only available with VU meters, but also in silver and black. Akai also made some great hi-fi components in the late 1970s and early 1980s, such as the AM2650 that was featured in one of our previous catalogs, and Akai's biggest receiver of all time, the AA1200, which we featured in our recent video where I tried out every monster receiver from the Stereo Wars era. During the 1980s, Akai, like many other brands, were also building VCRs. I mean, it makes sense, a VCR is more or less just a row to row of video heads. Akai would build the very first VCR with an on-screen display, the Akai VS2. Originally named the interactive monitor system, it displayed the system information directly on the TV, and this invention would eliminate the need for the user to be physically near the VCR to program a recording, read the counter, or perform other features. Then a few years, all competing manufacturers such as Sony and JVC adopted this technology. Akai would start manufacturing a lot more audio video equipment in the mid 1980s, everything from TVs to camcorders. In the mid 80s, Akai focus was going digital. Much like many other companies due to production costs, they started moving production out of Japan. The products that follow would be cheaper made mass market rack systems. Sold as matching components, you could get an entire rack system consisting of an amplifier, a tuner, a CD player, a cassette deck, turntable, and even storage for your vinyl, all for the price of one high-end audio component. It took hi-fi mainstream, but it was more mid-fi. Now, Kai was still building some high-end products during the 1980s and early 1990s, like the Reference Master Series. This was considered a handsome yet rugged system, with cutting-edge technical innovation, such as multi-stage noise shaping digital to analog conversion. There was also the AM Series, which was the tier right under the Reference, which featured a much higher build quality than a typical stereo of the 1990s. This would be comparable to, let's say, a Sony ES system. But unlike these high-end reference systems, most of their audio division was focused on those full audio rack systems because there was just a larger market and an even bigger bottom line. This was the last of Akai's product line, at least to my knowledge from what I could find. So what happened? Well, to find this out, we're gonna have to look to the top of the company, the chairman, James Ting. In August 1993, James Ting, CEO of the sewing machine maker Singer, gave a breakfast presentation to a group of investors at the Four Seasons Hotel in Vancouver, Canada. He was trying to raise $850 million in a mix of common stock and zero-coupon bonds. He told them what he was going to do with their money. The sequence of events was a bit complicated. The securities were to be issued by the Canadian holding company Ting Controlled called Semitech Corp. Semitech would send money to another Ting Controlled entity, this one based in Hong Kong called Semitech Global, later renamed Akai. With the cash, the Hong Kong company would leverage Singer's brand name and global distribution network into a Japanese style conglomerate. They would make not just sewing machines, but washing machines, cassette players, refrigerators, you name it. The scheme won the underwriting endorsement of two distinguished investment banks, and Ting got all his money. Six years later, in 1999, all the money was gone. Singer's successor to the respected 19th century manufacturer went into Chapter 11 bankruptcy in September, and its 18,000 employees left to wonder what would become of them. Ting, now 72 years old, was last known living in Hong Kong, and he maintained that Singer was the unfortunate victim of the Asian debt crisis. But there's more to this story. The story starts in the early 1970s as Shanghai-born Ting immigrated to Canada from Hong Kong to study engineering at the University of Toronto. He worked as a janitor to finance his education and started Semi-Tech Corp. in 1981 as an assembler of personal computers. Ting struck it rich when his accountant introduced him to Hong Kong billionaire Stanley Ho. 
who was looking for investments outside of Hong Kong. By then, Ting controlled two companies, the Canadian Semi-Tech Corp and a publicly traded Hong Kong subsidiary in which it had a 42% stake in called Semi-Tech Global, or Kai. The other 58 of Semi-Tip Global was owned by the insiders, including Ting, and by the public. At the time, Singer was a conglomerate controlled by the corporate raider Paul Bilzerian. Founded as a sewing machine manufacturer in 1851, Singer had long since diversified into the aerospace and electronics business. By the time Ting came calling, it was beginning to sell off pieces of his sewing machine business, which included both factories and a worldwide collection of retail outlets. But the brand had value and it was recognized the world over. In the late 1980s, Ting reassembled the Singer Empire. He incorporated it as Singer NV in the Netherlands and tucked ownership into his Hong Kong-based holdings company, Akai. Then in 1991, he took Singer public. He listed the shares on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, Ting cut costs at Singer by moving the manufacturing of sewing machines out of Brazil and Italy to China. In 1992, he bought a stake in Sansui as well a Japanese amplifier maker for 58 million. If you want to find out more about Sansui, check out that video. Then he purchased a Kai, a Japanese manufacturer of low-end video and audio equipment at the time for $172 million. And he also purchased Konghua, a Hong Kong-based television set maker for $300 million. Most of the operations were currently losing money, but Ting figured that Singer's huge marketing operation, 13,000 outlets, and 7,000 door-to-door salesmen would come to the rescue. Within a few years, Ting had transformed himself into a tycoon best known for being chauffeured around in Rolls Royces. He presided over the company now with sales above $2 billion. But while Ting micromanaged, he failed to include his outside directors in such important corporate decisions as acquisitions. Ting's empire began to unravel after the Asian devaluations of 1997. Ting announced a sweeping reorganization, including firing 5,000 Singer workers over three years. Singer reported a loss of $238 million for 1997. Singer was in real trouble, but Ting spent all its cash as if there was no tomorrow. And that same year, Ting also had Singer shut down a money-losing furniture maker that was also owned by Semitech Global. In that same month, Semitech Corp of Canada filed for bankruptcy. The only entity that seems to have survived is Ting's Hong Kong company, Semitech Global, otherwise known as Akai. But in 1999, even Akai would break into two. Akai and Akai Professional, which is their pro instrument division, started back in 1984. It then emerged that a year earlier, James Ting, the chairman of Akai, transferred ownership of Akai and Sansui over to Grande Holdings, which, get this, was also owned by James Ting. Liquidators would come to find out that since 1994, with the help of his accountants, Ernest and Young, Ting had stolen over $800 million from Akai. Ting would later be imprisoned for false accounting in 2005, and his accountants, Ernest and Young, would negotiate out a court settlement for over $200 million. Akai filed for insolvency in the year 2000, owing creditors over a billion dollars. Ting then fled to Canada to avoid investigation by Canadian and U.S. authorities, and eventually he was forced to return to Hong Kong, but left for China to avoid being investigated by Hong Kong's regulators from 2000 to 2003. Now, in 2003, he was forced to return to Hong Kong, where he was later arrested and investigated by the Hong Kong Police's Commercial Crimes Bureau. And on June 29, 2005, he was convicted to two counts of false accounting and was sentenced to six years in prison. But after serving only one year, Ting's conviction was overturned by Hong Kong's Court of Appeals, and he escaped retrial in 2006, then escaped another in 2007. Ting, now 72, is nowhere to be found. He's completely disappeared, and he has $800 million with them.